Hello, this is Hua Hai Yang from Juiji, an AI chatbot creator company. Today, I will present some data diffing based software architecture patterns. Let's begin with a definition. What is diffing? Diffing is an operation given two data elements A and B, calculate the differences D between A and B. It thus defines a pair of functions diff and patch. Diff takes A and B and produces the differences D. Patch takes the original A and the differences D and get back the original B. There are some important properties of diffing that makes it a very useful tool for software architecture. First, diffs are unidirectional. The diff of A and B is not the same as diff of B and A. Secondly, diffing is also addictive. Concatenating the diff of A and B with the diff of B and C, you will get back diff of A and C. These two properties make diffing an ideal tool for tracking changes. Moreover, the size of the differences D is normally much smaller than either of the original A or B, making it suitable for data storage and data transformation over networks. Finally, it is much quicker to run patch than to run diff so data recovery from diffs is normally quick and cheap. So not surprisingly, as early as 1974, diff and patch have been developed as Unix programs by Bell Lab. These programs have been widely used even to today. These programs work with line of text and are mainly useful for comparing text files, tracking changes, verifying output, or being used in version control systems. Since 1980s, additional use of diffing happened in the 3D computer graphics community. In the same graph approach of computer graphics rendering, the world is modeled as a same graph the rendering engine traverses the graph to render the scene under strict time requirement. For example, it must finish rendering a frame within 30 milliseconds. So in order to meet those requirements, one of the performance optimizations used is to only render the changed subtrees in the same graph. So this requires diffing the same graph of the current frame with that of the previous frame. The benefit of this rendering approach is that it has a conceptually simple programming model. Programmers can pretend that everything is re-rendered in every frame. So this conceptual simplicity inspired the popular React web rendering framework. Where a Clojure script wrapper of React would actually be faster than React itself sometimes. Due to the career script's immutable data structure enables faster rendering by producing faster diffing. So in Clojure, we would like to work with data. So we are not going to be diffing text. Instead, we'll be diffing data. Also, we would like to run diffing on generic data structures, not specialized programming constructs wrapped in classes. So by taking advantage of generic immutable data structures, we could elevate the data diffing approach to the level of software architecture consideration, not just as an implementation technique used for only for performance optimization or data savings. Next, I will show that the use of diffing 
can have positive impact on system design, data modeling, and API design. So the first benefit of diffing for software architecture stems from the generic nature of diff and patch functions. In a sense, chief and patch are blind functions, for they don't have to understand the semantics of the input to do what they are designed to do. In the case of information sender and receiver, suppose the sender did some changes on its own data A to arrive at new data A prime, it then computes the differences of A and A prime and sends the diff to the receiver. The receiver does not have to know what the sender did with A. The process of turning A to A prime may be quite involved, having lots of complexities. The receiver is oblivious to all of that complexity. All it needs to do is to run patch on its copy of A with the received diff. It then gets the desired results, A prime, without understanding much of what actually happened on the sender side. Because the semantics of the changes on the sender side can be completely opaque for the receiver, this semantic asymmetry enforces kind of separation of concerns. It is also a kind of lateral encapsulation, but not forced like in object-oriented programming, because the differences D is still open for inspection. So this is a kind of graded decoupling. The data receiver don't need to know a lot for things to work, but it can also know a lot if it decided to inspect and record the differences. Another architectural benefit is that diffing encourages data model reuse. A pair of diff and patch functions is like a pair of teleportation devices. Data can be replicated on the other side without much fuss because the data replication becomes cheap. It becomes beneficial to reuse the same data model in different parts of the system rather than each part come up with its own data models. This will dramatically simplify system design. As we know, most of our programming is just data transformation from one shape to another. Data model reuse saves a lot of work. Finally, diffing is very good for tracking changes. When each version of the data model can be cheaply saved and replayed to recover the original versions, a lot of interesting things can be done. For example, we can tweak the versions of the world to find one that suits our purpose, like in Tom Cruise's Age of Tomorrow movie. Cheap versioning also provides a way to manage the states of stateful applications, allow states to be externalized, achieving effective stateless architecture with stateful data models. In order to do all that, we have developed a data diffing library for Clojure and Clojure script. We call it Edit Script. Edit Script works on all regular Clojure data structures, vectors, lists, sets, and maps. You can also implement our protocols to handle your own custom data structures. The diff produced by Edit Script is a vector of edits. Each edit is a vector of three or two elements. The path, the operator, which include add, delete, and replace. And finally, the value for add and replace operation. Two diffing algorithms are provided in edit script. A quick algorithm is very fast, but it produces suboptimal diffing in terms of size and another A-star algorithm, which is slower, but produce optimal diffing in size. Depending on your use case, both algorithms are quite useful. In practice, we have been using edit script in production for a couple of years. So one major use of edit script 
that saved us a lot of time and efforts is in our recent user interface rewrite for our GUG Studio product. GUG Studio is a GUI tool for users to create AI-driven chatbots. As the product grows in features, we started to feel that changes become harder to make and the UI iterations become slowed down. Compounded with some usability issues, we decided to rewrite the user interface. This rewrite turned out to be a major success. It was done very quickly, within a matter of months. Rewrite included both UI redesign and re-implementation. So this is a screenshot of the UI before the rewrite. And this is a screenshot after the rewrite. The new UI has more features and is also much easier to work with. So we attribute this success mainly to our switching from a user UU resource-oriented API to a Diffin-based API. So let's look at some details. Juji Studio is a single-page application written in Reframe. The UI states are all in an Eden document, what we call a config doc. It is basically a listed clear map containing all kinds of information about the chat configuration, sections, topics, questions, follow-up questions, conditions, and so on and so forth. Most of these have direct mapping to some UI elements on screen. So on the server side, the same config doc is maintained. In addition, the config doc is persisted in the database, saved as a JSON document in Postgres. So when we started to develop Juji Studio, we took the usual traditional approach, which is to treat the server side config doc as the truth, because this is what uh, been persisted in the database. So each path or each load of the config doc is a remote resources that need to be managed in a restful manner. Also, we are using GraphQL for API, but the model of client-server communication is the same as REST. Basically, web client conduct CRUD operations on remote resources on the server. To do that, we have to write a lot of repetitive CRUD GraphQL calls like this. For each and every type of loads in our config doc, because we have many different types of loads, our GraphQL schema file grows to be thousands of lines of Eden code. So I'll look at our new schema after we write. We now only do CRUD operation on the config doc as a whole. Update the config doc becomes just sending the diff of the config doc. Now all the logic is concentrated in the single page application on the client side. The client periodically sends its config doc changes to the server. The server blindly applies the diff to patch its own copy of the config doc, save the doc in the database, and return a document SHA to the single page application. So the single page application validates that the received documentation SHA is the same as its own SHA and then consider this operation successful and continue its business. So all the API calls on different loads in the config doc now removed, replaced by a few API calls on config doc. Create doc, fetch doc, update doc, and save doc which is front-end developers no longer touches once it was written. Because the front-end developers has complete control of the data model and did not need to be concerned with the server side, they could quickly revamp the entire UI of Juju Studio. It took less than a month to go from design inception to the end of implementation. So the stiffing based API architecture is well suited to single-page application, where the logics um, concentrated in the UI and the server side doesn't need to know what exactly the SPA did. All it does is persist in the state.
Another use of diffing is to externalize application states. So it is easier to scale stateful applications. For example, Juji creates a chatbot agent for each chat session. We call each such agent a rep. It's a shorthand for responsible empathetic persona. So each rep has its own unique mental state, so to speak, which is stored in an atom. So each application server loads may contain many such running wraps when people, multiple people are con conversation, making conversation on our platform. So what if a server load goes down, become unavailable? We do not want to stop ongoing chat sessions. So one way to solve this problem is to externalize each wraps state by asynchronously send diffs of its states to a persistent log, such as a Kafka topic. So after each utterance, a rep will save the diff between its current state to its previous one. So this is a cheap operation, doesn't take a lot of storage. When a server load becomes unavailable, the API gateway would forward traffic to another server load. Once a new server come up, it doesn't say the needed state to continue a conversation. It will fetch the diffs of the web state from the persistent log and simply sequentially applying all the diffs to a shared initial state. So this will recover the web state and then enable the conversation to resume. So far, we have only treated each diff as a black box the receiver of the diff does not have to look at the content of the diff. All it needs to do is to blindly apply the diff. However, when it's necessary, diff can also be inspected to extract useful information. After all, a diff is just a piece of data. So here's an example. So we use two component system to manage stateful components. So one component called reps is a container for all the states of the reps. There are other components that are containers for subscription data, such as there's a chat component for holding web sockets, GraphQL subscriptions, and call async channels for chat. There's a Facebook component for holding pages and the page specific IDs and so on. So all those components live in their own namespaces. So when a chat is finished, this system resources needs to be freed or cleaned up. So since work well if all work is initiated by the system. However, since our chat support mixed initiative, the user may take initiative to terminate a chat, for example by saying a goodbye or stop and so on. A user level function now is needed to clean up the server resources, which requires access to the system level components. So such arrangement can easily get into a situation where you have a circular dependency on your hand. For instance, here Facebook and chat components contain some subscriptions. So in order to free those subscriptions, a user level function clear Cleaning up chat have to depend on those components, but these components but may also depend on already depend on um, by the parents of those user level functions, creating a circular dependency. So in general, you will have a case of uh, closed and coupled components. To detangle those coupling. So instead of depending on namespaces that contain those system subscriptions, our user level function can just watch the reps atom. So when it changes, we we'll just inspect its diff between the old value and the new value and try to match the cases where a rep is removed or it's been cleaned. So once the desired match pattern is detected in the diff, the user level function can send the message to the chat channel saying, okay, the user has left, which will automatically initiate the system level cleanup process. 
so this pattern of watching an atom that contains a, the value of another component then perform different actions based on the content of the diff between the old and the new value is a very general way to distangle the dependency between components. So now hard-coded dependencies have been replaced by flexible pattern matches on diff data. So far, we have only covered cases where one party sends changes to another party in the form of a diff. So what happens when multiple parties send diffs to the same data model at the same time? That's a difficult problem of collaborative editing. So in this diagram, you have two parties are sending diffs to each other. So when those lines crosses, data can get out of sync because diffs may be applied on the wrong data. So this is a difficult yet common problem. For example, how to enable multiple users to edit the same chat at the same time in the Juji platform? The traditional solution to this kind of problem including knocking, so which will forcefully serialize the updates so that there are low crossing lines. But the user experience is very bad because the user have to wait in turns to edit the document. Another approach is for a selected coast to perform three-way merges of everyone's existing updates so far, then send back to everyone the merged version. Again, the latency is bad for this approach because updates has to be waited, have to wait for the end of this round trip of the three-way merges. So a single slow load will slow down everybody else. So it turned out there's another approach which is based on diffing offers a better solution. So this diffing based solution is called differential synchronization. It is a scalable, tort for tort for tolerant and low latency method for collaborative editing. It was developed in 2009 and it is what Google Docs use for collaborative editing. So let's take a look. To simplify, first, let's assume everything happens on the same host. So in addition to the client and the server copy of the data, there's a common copy. It's called the common shadow. So the client, after done some editing, first computes a diff of its own data with that of the shadow, then saves its data in the shadow, and finally sends the diff to the server. The server takes the diff, applies the diff on its own copy. Now it repeats the same steps in reverse. The server will do the diff between its own data and the shadow and then send the diff to the client. So it's repeating the cycle, the so data become eventually in sync. So now let's look at the realistic cases of the client and server live on different hosts. So we will split the common shadow into a client shadow and a server shadow. So the rest of the algorithm is the same. The only addition is a char or checksum of the client shadow needs to be sent along with the diff. So the server shadow can be validated to be the same as the client shadow. So if the shadows fail to match, We'll send the whole document over to overwrite the server's copy. So like what we did in our diff-based GraphQL API. So in the case of network outage or partition, data obviously will be out of sync for a while. Once network is restored in order to resume synchronization, an extra backup shadow is needed on the server side keep a previous state of the data. In addition, each copy of transmitted edits needs to be acknowledged. So as we said, should be sent when a batch of edits are received. 
So in order to do that, we also need a unique identifier for each batch of edits. So on acknowledged edits, we'll be putting a queue. So when network is restored, the backup shadow will be loaded and the queued edits on the client will be sent over and applied on the backup shadow and then from there on the normal synchronization process will continue. So when there are more than two parties involved in the synchronization, some different topologies can be designed to duplicate a similar setup between a pair of hosts. For example, in this depicted topology, two server hosts synchronize with each other, while each synchronize with multiple clients of its own. So many other possible topology can be devised. So in general, this diffing-based approach is scalable, fault-tolerant, and performs well. The only limitation is that there can be only one edit transmission in flight on the network at any given moment. But if the network speed is acceptable, the user experience will be acceptable. So before we conclude, we offer a recommendation for data modeling that is suitable for diffing-based architecture. To dramatize our recommendation, our slogan will be don't use vector, which actually means that we need to minimize the use of ordered data structures, such as vector or NIST. The reason is that diffing algorithm is much slower for ordered data structure than for unordered data structure. For order is a very hard constraint to maintain. So diffing algorithms for ordered data is um, usually order of magnitude slower than unordered data. Where unordered data diffing is just linear to the data size, for one pass to go through the ordered data is enough for diffing them. But a transformation matrix is required for diffing ordered data. In addition, realistically, much of the implicit order we encounter in the real world are incidental. So we are likely introducing incidental complexity when we use vectors as a data model because meaningful orders is often imposed by the order in the data fields, not by the elements themselves. So a vector of maps is really bad for diffing, and it should, if possible, to com be converted into a map of maps or a set of maps. So in conclusion, we offered a few examples to showcase a few less properties of diffing that can lead to simplified software architecture, enhanced system decoupling, easier scanning of stateful applications, and a better solution to data synchronization problems. So it is worthwhile to consider using data diffing based software architecture, particularly for data-oriented programming like we do in Clojure. So thank you for listening. Happy coding.